Welcome to yet another episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. Today we are reading Eddard 7. Eddard 7, the seventh Neddard chapter. Ned is right in the thick of it now. He is embroiled in the pots and the plots and it's boiling and broiling and shit is happening. We've got a lot of, of 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 pages to get through, so we're going to put the we're going to put the abridged back in Game of Thrones abridged. We're going to to speed through this chapter, like like never before. No one knew we could be this fast. It it's it's tremendous. Sorry. Anyway, uh, so so Ned, our good Ned, is standing over the body. Of Sir Hugh of the Vale, that young knight who died at the end of a lance of Gregor Clegane. Uh, and Ned is chatting with Barristan, one of the few men in this city who he actually likes and respects and has a similar sort of set of values to. Uh, and Barristan has been standing vigil over the corpse of Sir Hugh because he had no one else. A mother in the veil, he's told, but no one else here to stand by his body but good old Barristan the Bold. Uh, and Ned is standing over this corpse going, uh, shit, was he killed because of me? Because, of course, Ned is suspecting that Sir Hugh has been murdered by Gregor Clegane as part of some Lannister plot to cover up the death of John Arryn or something, but Ned does not yet know. He supposes that he will never know, and he is right. He hasn't got a whole lot of knowing left in him before he loses his neddy little head. Uh, so anyway, they talk about Sir Hugh, uh, and he was young, uh, knighted a bit too early. He wasn't ready, Barristan says. And Ned says, oh, none of us is ever ready. And Barristan says, what, for knighthood? And Ned says, for death. Which is a very sort of morbid, Starkian thing to say. But of course it also foreshadows Ned's own impending doom, for which he is not ready either. Uh, and also Ned is talking about just sort of the waste, like the waste that someone should die for the sake of a tournament, for the sake of entertainment. Uh, Ned talks about how the loss is needless. War should not be a game. Because, of course, the attitude of the Starks is that you've got you to preserve your resources for when it really matters, not waste them for the sake of a show. Because up in the north, where things are hard... You don't waste sweat and blood for when you might need it later. You bottle it and store it in a labelled vial. Break glass in case of emergency. That's where you should keep your liquids. Uh, <laughs> and they talk about the Silent Sisters. The Silent Sisters are interesting. Uh, the Silent Sisters are the group of, of, of people whose job it is to prepare dead bodies for the grave. They do the death rites in Westerosi society, uh, and they don't speak. They are silent sisters, and their faces are veiled, because it is, uh, it's not right to look upon the face of death. Do the silent sisters remind anyone else of the faceless men? They also have a bit of face shenanigans happening, and they are a sort of religious e group who deals with death, that there are definite similarities there. I wonder if they have a similar similar philosophical roots, some kind of connection, some kind of cooperation, maybe even. Not that there's any evidence for that that I'm aware of. I'm glad that they included a silent sister fairly prominently in season two or three at one point. Uh, in the scene where Rob meets Talisa Megia, there's a silent sister around and they give the Silent Sister quite an interesting sort of costume and sort of look, which I'm, I appreciate that they included that in the show. Um, and they talk about Sir Hugh's armour. He has quite a nice, expensive set of armour for a young knight. Um, and Ned decides to send... Yeah, he decides to send the armour to Sir Hugh's poor mother, instead of sending the armour to the armourer that Sir Hugh bought the armour off, and apparently at this point uh, seems not to have entirely paid for. So Ned does the righteous thing and the and the sympathetic thing, the sensitive thing, and he chooses to give the armour to the mother. 
instead of the armorer, even though that might technically be the more correct thing to do, because Ned will make concessions when it comes to protecting the innocent and doing the right thing. He will take the sword of the Danes back to, to, to the Dane house, and he will lie and defame his own honor to protect his sister's bastard. Ned will bend principles in order to do what he perceives as right. And then we get a food description. There's fat sausages, there's garlic, there's pepper. This sausage is not of the fat pink variety. It's it's just uh, pork, I think. Uh, and there's all these people hanging out after the after the fighting. Well, no, it's morning, and they're about to do the next day of the tournament. Uh, and they're talking about how the king is planning to fight in the melee, uh, and, and Ned responds to that grimly, because he thinks that's probably a bad idea, as indeed it is. Uh, and and talks about how Robert Baratheon is sort of pig-headed and stubborn, and once he says he's going to do something, when he says, I'm going to fight in the melee, nothing will convince him otherwise. He he won't forget his stupid, drunken decisions. He'll stick with them. Um, and it's actually kind of a funny line, because after this line saying that Robert Baratheon would remember his his drunken promises, there's actually a later chapter, a few Ned chapters later, where Ned thinks Robert would often make drunken promises or declarations of love to some woman and then forget them in the morning. So I've got quite directly contradictory lines. I mean, they're both sort of compatible. All right, we're we're getting bogged down. No tangents here. Uh, Moving on. Uh, They talk about Robert's Warhammer. It's cool. And then Lancel is here. Lancel Lannister is Robert Baratheon's squire. Uh, And they're trying to fit the armor onto King Robert, but they can't because King Robert is fat. Uh, But King Robert's having a lot of fun uh, messing with the squires. Uh, They eventually send the squires off to look for a breastplate stretcher, which of course is a non-existent item. It's like striped paint. They're sending the interns off to to photocopy a floppy disk. They're just giving him a ridiculous job to keep them busy for amusement. Because that's what interns are for. That's what that's what the young are for, honestly. The young exist for the amusement and caffeine delivery needs of their betters and elders. That, that's the, That's the way it should be. Uh, anyway, so Ned is concerned by all these Lancel Lannister squires around because it means that the king is surrounded by more Lannisters, people who have the emerald green eyes of the queen. So Ned is remembering here that Littlefinger has warned him about all the spies that the queen has watching the king and Ned and everyone. Um, and Robert brings up Lyanna Stark, as he is wont to do. Uh, he he says that, oh, you know, Cersei's such a so-and-so for trying to stop me from fighting in the melee. Lyanna Stark would never have done that. She was the perfect woman. She was just the ma- manic pixie dream girl who I needed. This woman would be the solution that would solve all of my problems and make me into a better person. I throw away all responsibility for my self-betterment and instead idealize a perfect woman Gatsby green light in order to represent everything that I need in my life, and that's the that's what I'm gonna do. And then Ned's like, "What the fuck are you talking about? You you never even knew Leanna, really. She was my sister. She was a fucking wild thing. She was as bloody mad as you are. She's not gonna fucking straighten you out. Don't idealize her into the personification of your own betterment. What the fuck are you doing?" And Robert says. Oh, I'm Robert Baratheon. Ah, I want to hit things. Ah, I'm sad that I've failed to mature as a person, and I'm perpetually the young, uh, younger version of myself. Because when people find success too early, they find their psychology to be locked into the way they were put before. It's like Thom York is perpetually a sad teenager. Bah. That's what Robert Baratheon. <clears throat> says. Uh, and then, so they have a bit of banter, and uh, and then and then Robert just acts like an eight-year-old, basically. Because uh, Barristan and Ned point out to King Robert that, you know, if you actually do fight in the melee, no one's going to actually hit you because you're the king, and no one wants to piss off the bloody 
king for fear of getting their heads cut off or something. So what's the point of fighting in the melee? And Robert's response to that completely reasonable objection is to throw his armor at Selmy and say, get out before I kill you. Robert throws a big old tanty. He spits the dummy right in the dirt and he just has a fucking toddler level tanty is what King Robert does. Uh, and it's pretty sad. And Ned is like, wow, this is pretty sad. Uh, and then Robert says, but since I'm the king, I'm going to force you to sit down and listen to me rant about how sad I am. Uh, and so, so Ned sits down and listens to Robert. And Robert goes on about how he hates being a king, and it's so shit, and he has to do all this stuff, and he's not happy anymore, he's sad, he feels dead. Uh, but of course, he's always... Robert refuses to accept any responsibility for the state of his life. Like, the way he phrases it, look, he says, like, look what kinging has done to me. It's not about, look how I've responded, look at my failures, look at my decisions. It's all about, look what these external forces have done to my life. Look, I'm therapizing Robert Baratheon, this is great, all those... It's, it's counselling, up fucking Dr. Freud up in this shit. And then Robert's like, uh, oh, you know, I was so happy when I was young and I was winning the throne and I was fighting, uh, but, you know, oh, now everything sucks so much. John Aaron made me marry Cersei and blah, she's she guards her cunt as though it has all the gold of castle rock between her legs. And there's talk of beer. It, interesting. Uh, bit is that Robert says, uh, "Oh, I'm sorry about the business with Lady and Joffrey and put and killing Lady and Nymeria and all that stuff. Uh, no doubt, my son was lying about the whole situation. I'd stake my life on it." So Robert Baratheon has some awareness of like the bullshit that he perpetuates under his watch. Uh, he isn't totally like ignorant of of all the deception and stuff around him. He just chooses not to look or to ignore it because it's easier. Robert Baratheon, in all his warhammer swinging warrior bloodlust courage, is a coward. He's more of a coward than Sam Tarly. Sam Tarly faces hard truths. Not very effectually sometimes, but he faces them. Whereas Robert Baratheon, for all his fucking testosterone, doesn't. That's why he's a shit kid. But pathos. There's pathos here. Sympathy. Have it. Uh, and they. Oh, and so Robert Baratheon talks about, oh, all this king stuff sucks. You know what I want to do? I want to give up my crown, take my warhammer, cross the narrow sea and be a mercenary, a sellsword in the east. How fucking fun would that be? No responsibilities, hitting things all day, fuck whoever I want. Wouldn't that be fantastic? The singers would love it. And no doubt they would. That would be <laughs> that would be kind of cool if the king just decided, I don't want to be king. It would be like if Donald Trump just got up and decided, I just want to uh, golf, and I'll just put put down my presidential crown. How, how would that... Let's not... All right. So they talk about, and they also talk. He also talks about Joffrey. He's like, "How did I make a son who is such a psychotic little shit stain?" Uh, and the sad part about that, of course, is that Robert didn't make Joffrey. Joffrey is the son of Jamie and Cersei, and so it is sad that 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 Robert feels like he has some responsibility for the creation of that twisted little evil fucking monster monster man. Uh, I mean, I mean, look, there are many things that are Robert Baratheon's fault. Many, many failings. But Joffrey isn't one of them. Well, actually, I take that back. Because as we learned in the last Sansa chapter, Robert Baratheon's maybe not the best parent. And in fact, his terrible parenting might have something to do with the development of Joffrey into, before said mentioned, twisted little psycho shit stain monster. Uh, so I suppose he does bear some responsibility in that regard, even if Joffrey isn't his kid. Anyway, uh, and he just sort of complains a lot. He doesn't like the Lannisters. Uh, there's more food descriptions. Uh, Ro- Ro- so Robert uh, recalls the past again when when Ned and he were boys growing up in the Eyrie, and that was that's his, sort of his nostalgia. That's his red door. That's his moment of of being in a good place, 
Um, and for a moment, Ned sort of engages with Robert's sort of uh, nostalgia, and he's like, yeah, no, things were good back then. We are, we are mates. We are good people. We're going to pull this together. So Ned has a moment of optimism. Uh, and he goes back to his family, and he's sort of smiling some more, being a bit less grim. Uh, it's mentioned that Septim Ordain is ill today, uh, poisoned by Oberon Martel, confirmed. Uh, and he goes and he goes and sits next to his daughter Sansa, and Ned watches the jousting, the tawny that's happening. And Sandor Clegane comes out, uh, and and Jamie Lannister comes out. And we have a bit of banter between Lord Renly and Littlefinger. Uh, Renly has good dialogue when he's hanging around in King's Landing in the in the first book, and it's a shame that a lot most of that didn't make it into the first season. I think I think Renly in later seasons would have been a more effective character if we got to see more of him in season one. But can't have everything. Uh, and and Jamie Jamie's showboating. Jamie's kind of playing the crowd. He's he really is a fucking prince charming in, in the first book. He, he's tossing kisses to random women, and he's got his glittering golden armor and his glittering gold. Even his horse is wearing glittering golden cloth. It's ridiculous. And Sansa is watching it all, moist eyed and eager, moist eyed sounds gross to say but i think that i think it carries across a lot of what sansa is about uh it, it's 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 naivety it, it's it's visual spectacle it's it's emotion it's it's rose tinted glasses it's all communicated i think by moist eyes uh and then there's there's the jousting and men hitting each other with sticks it's all terribly important um and Jamie is knocked off his horse by Sandor Clegane. Uh, and he lands on his bum, and he's he's got a helmet in the shape of a snarling lion, and falling off the horse, the helmet gets jammed onto his head such that he can't take it off again, and the crowd is laughing, hollering, and hooting at him. Uh, Tywin would not be happy if he saw that. Uh, and then Gregor Clegane comes out, and Gregor Clegane is ridiculously large. And they tell some of the backstory of Gregor Clegane, how he killed uh, the infant Aegon Targaryen and his mother, Elia. Uh, apparently, well, apparently, yeah, he raped Elia, as Oberyn would later uh, would would later accuse him of. They describe they sort of describe Gregor Clegane's home life a little bit, which is kind of intriguing. They describe him as a solitary man who seldom. Leaves his own lands. What do you reckon Gregor Clegane does in his free time? Because all we ever see him do uh, is just is is killing and hurting and raping. What what does he do in his off time? Like he must. I mean, what does Gregor Clegane have for breakfast? Uh, what what pastimes does he enjoy? Does he play Scrabble, Yahtzee? Uh, he might be a Connect Four man. Maybe. I, I don't know. Probably something more terrible, though, because we have all these descriptions of what his home, the Clegane Keep, is like. It's apparently a grim place uh, where a lot of unexplained deaths happen. Servants, apparently, disappear unaccountably, and uh, Gregor's first two wives uh, died mysteriously, uh, and and it was a hunting accident that killed Gregor's father. Was it an accident, though? As Varys himself says, the, the, the woods are, are the abattoir of the gods. The life of a hunter is a perilous one. Uh, maybe Gregor killed his dad. Uh, so, and then, and then the day that happened, Sandor Clegane, Gregor's brother, left to work with the Lannisters. And he had never returned to the Clegane Keep, not even to visit. No love lost there. And then Loras Tyrell comes out, the Knight of Flowers. Loras is described as slender as a reed. Which you'd think would not make you a very good fighter, being slender as a reed. You'd think you'd need some brawn and some weight in order to fight effectively. Even if you are sort of, you know, a skillful bloody water dancer. If you're jousting and shit, surely... I don't know. Uh, so, but yeah, Knight of Flowers also has a ridiculously ostentatious costume and showboating and blah, blah, blah. Sansa is wearing the rose that Loras Tyrell gave her the previous day. Uh, she's idolizing Loras. He's so beautiful, she says. Uh, and, and they joust, and the Knight of Flowers uses this 
trick of using a mare in heat when the mountain is using a stallion, uh, which uh, which uses the same trick you can use on pretty much anyone with a Y chromosome, which is dangle dangle a bit of uh, a bit of so and so in front of it, and it'll get distracted enough to lose. Uh, so the hound Gregor Clegane loses to Sir Loris Tyrell, uh, and since Gregor Clegane, you know, is an adult uh, and who can handle his defeats, uh, you know, with maturity, uh, much like Robert Baratheon, uh, Gregor Clegane's response to the situation is to um, is to come boiling to his feet, which is a wonderful phrase. Boiling to his feet, it's rising, it's angry, it's hot. He rises, boiling to his feet, his face dark with fury, his hair down over his eyes. He's got long hair, which none of the three Gregor Clegane actors in the show do. Uh, he grabs his sword, and he uh, and he kills his horse with a single blow that almost severs the animal's neck. So much like Robert Baratheon, Gregor Clegane blames his, his problems... Uh, on outside for well, I suppose in this particular case it was outside forces that caused Gregor to lose. Anyway, so Gregor decides to try to kill Loras Tyrell, uh, and he almost does, but then uh, Sandor Clegane intervenes, uh, and they fight the Mountain and the Hound, two of the greatest and biggest warriors in Westeros, duke it out for the whole bloody everyone to see which was done pretty well in the show, I thought. So they go at each other, um, and Gregor looks like he's trying to kill his brother, aiming savage blows at the hound's head helmet. Um, but Sandor never sends a cut at his brother's unprotected face, which is interesting. Sandor clearly hates his brother, but he doesn't try to kill Gregor. So, I don't know. What is Sandor's... What 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 would Sandor like to happen to Gregor? We don't really know. Uh, anyway, so they, then the fighting gets stopped when Robert Baratheon shouts in all caps lock to stop this madness, and they, and they mention, Ned mentions how, uh, it's important to have a good commander's battlefield voice in medieval society, because of course they don't have uh, megaphones, uh, or, or, or intercoms, or, uh, or, or sound systems, so you've just got to shout real good. Which would get fucking exhausting. Anyway, so he shouts and they stop, and um, and everyone cheers the hound. The hound has saved the beloved knight of flowers from the mad mountain, and so Loris is like, uh, even though because um, now the last two combatants in the tournament, the last two remaining people are, are Loris and Sandor, and Loris goes like, well, you just saved my life, so I'm going to be gallant and say, hey, I think you have just officially won the tournament. I'll, I'll concede to you, Sandor wins, and so everyone cheers for Sandor, and so for the first time in his life, the common people express love for the Hound. I wonder what kind of impact that had on Sandor, someone who is so consistently alienated and hated by everyone, is suddenly shown overwhelming love and approval by hundreds of people. I wonder what that means to him as a man and a dog. Probably something. Uh, and uh, they talk a little bit about how Loras clearly sort of planned this trick by using the mare and the stallion, uh, which sort of is a example of some tricksy Tyrell trickery. Uh, and, uh, Barristan says, oh, well, there's small honour in tricks, and then Renly says, well, there's small honour, but there's 20,000 gold. That's the purse for the win of the champion of the tournament, which is, I suppose, a theme of this series as a whole. It's about doing the right honourable thing, and how that will often not be as effective as doing the shady, the shady, nasty thing, as people like Littlefinger teach us over and over it's, it's, Song of Ice and Fire is kind of about, like, how doing bad shit can be a more effective means to an end, but what do you lose by doing that? Is there not some kind of inherent value in doing things the right way, even if it's not the easy way? Kill the boy and let the man be born. Jon Snow does the right thing, the hard thing, instead of the easy thing. And it gets him killed. <laughs> Uh, but good thing he he gets resurrected. That's the problem. 
with fantasy, isn't it? Like, a fantasy book can give you this lesson of you should do the, the right thing and the hard thing instead of the easy thing, uh, because it'll get good results. But then you go, well, hold on, I'm not Jon Snow, I haven't got a Valyrian steel sword, and I haven't got a fire priestess to resurrect me, so how can I apply that moral lesson to my daily life? And then the fantasy books goes, I don't know, buy the sequel. And then you go, oh, maybe I should read something better. Fantasy has limits. Anyway, um, so shit just sort of happens. The melee starts. Thoros of Mir wins it. Thoros of Mir has a fascinating arc. Uh, and, uh, and Thoros is fearless. And Thoros, of course, looks physically very different to how he does later, and his personality is very different to how it is later. And uh, they describe all the injuries and casualties that happen as a result of the melee. Uh, and this is another example of all the wasted resources and blood and shit that sweat, <laughs> sweat, sweat that is shed for no good reason. Ned, St- Ned Stark, Ned does not approve of this waste of energy. Um, the Lannisters aren't around, which makes Ned, which makes Ned pleased. Although it probably shouldn't, because if the Lannisters aren't around, if you can't see the Lannisters, it probably means they're away somewhere plotting against you. If not plotting against you, then screwing probably, like golden-haired little rabbits. One of the two. Neither is good. You want the Lannisters where you can see them, is where you want the Lannisters. Keep your friends close, and your Lannisters closer. And your enemies closest of all. Uh, and and then Aya turns up. Aya's back from a dancing lesson, and she says, Look, Sansa, look, I've got these bruises. And Sansa's like, Whoa, you must be a terrible dancer. And it is kind of hilarious that, that Aya is... Of course, her dancing lessons are sword-fighting lessons with Syria Pharrell, and dancing is, is the cover for what they actually are. And it's kind of hilarious that Sansa is so completely hoodwinked by that. Um, and, 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 yeah, we get some sort of stuff about how Arya is getting better, Arya is getting stronger, you know, sword fighting training montage, Arya is leveling up as a character, uh, and Ned thinks about how Syria Pharrell is a bit of a fruit loop, but whatever, Arya seems to like him, uh, and and they and Ned sort of again observes the differences between Sansa and Arya. Sansa with her dreams and Arya with her bruises, which really kind of sums up their whole deal, doesn't it? Arya is very much about suffering in a lot of ways. Arya suffers terribly throughout the season, and in a lot of ways her suffering defines her, whereas Sansa has these dreams, these illusions and naiveties, these hopes of the way life can be, but, but she soon realizes that her dreams are not accurate. Uh, she wakes from her dreams. That's sort of what happens with both characters. And anyway, Ned goes back to his tower, uh, and and from his tower, Ned notices it's dark now, but Ned notices the glow of candlelight from Littlefinger's window. The hour is well past midnight. So not only are the Lannisters off, presumably plotting and, 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 and rolling in the hay, Littlefinger is up all night, plotting presumably. Littlefinger's up to shit, and you should be scared. And then Ned sort of reflects on all the plots and shit that are going on. He's trying to work out why anyone would want to kill Bran. He tra- he's looking at the dagger. He's trying to figure out the death of John Arryn. He can't fucking work it out. He thinks about Gendry, and he's like, yep, I'm totally certain that, that Gendry is Robert Brathian's son, uh, and he's trying to figure stuff out, what's going on, uh, and and then he thinks a bit about Robert's trueborn children, and the two dots are just about to connect. Ned is just about to... The, all the all those little starky brain cogs are turning. He's just about to work out that, 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 that Joffrey is not the trueborn son of Robert. But then there's a rap on the door. Knock, knock. And Ned's fragile train of thought is derailed. Uh, and someone at, someone's at the door. Knock, knock. It is a strange man, a stout man in mud-caked boots with features hidden by a cowl with a strange low voice. Who is this mysterious man at his door? Takes off his hood. Ta-da! It's Varys. Varys is a master of disguise. Important plot point. Wasn't really included in the show. In the show, Varys is just Varys. In, well, he wears a funny, a funny hood at one point. But in the books, Varys is like fucking... Well, he's almost like a faceless man, but he's always changing his identity. Um... Which and and he's also and he also knows about all the secret tunnels in the Red Keep. Varus can move around undetected, secreting his secret machinations. That's the kind of 
dude he is. Um, and so that, that, it doesn't really serve any plot purpose that Varus just turned up in disguise, but it tells us as a reader that Varus is capable of such things. He is mama. Uh, and Varus points out, hey, by the way, you realize that the Lannisters are trying to kill your friend King Robert, right? And Ned's like, oh, really? And and Varys is like, yeah, they were hoping to kill him in the melee. Like, Cersei would have just made a deal with some guy. Yo, you kill the king uh, and I'll, I'll blow you because that's Cersei's modus operandi usually. Uh, and and your, your best friend would be dead. And Varys is like, shh. And Ned's like, shit. That's 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 suboptimal. Uh, and then Varys is like, there's machinations afoot, man. Uh, so, so Ned's optimism g- just goes right back down the shitter again after its brief peak before. Uh, and, and they talk about, you know, what Varys presumes Cersei's plot would be. Um, and... And they talk about sort of just general, the nature of intrigue and plots. Varys talks about how, well, I didn't know whether I could trust you. And he talks about how there are two different sorts of people, people who are loyal to the realm and people who are loyal only to themselves. Um, and it's sort of implied that Ned is one of the very, very few who is loyal to the realm. Although you got to question that, because Ned, I think Ned's more loyal to some sort of abstract series of principles. And he is loyal to House Stark more than any other. Uh, I don't know if he could really be said to serve the realm as such. That's a bit abstract, but anyway. Uh, it, it is interesting, Varys's whole continual thing about saying that he serves the realm, when it really is not at all clear that that's actually what his goal is. His actual goal seems to be to get young Griff on the throne, and it's really not clear if that serves the realm. Maybe Varys has convinced himself that it does. Uh, but... But Varys says some nice sort of lines. He's, he talks about the nature of being Varys, being the spider. What would happen if Cersei decided to cut off my head? North or south, they sing no songs for spiders. Who would mourn poor Varys? Uh, and and again, for almost every chapter, Var- uh, Ned has one of these moments. Ned has a moment of going, wow, I hate it here. I hate the secrets, I hate the plots, I hate the intrigues. I want to go back to the clean simplicity of the North, where the only things I need to worry about is the winter and the wildlings. Anything with a W is all I need to worry about. Uh, And, but sadly, that is not where Eddard is. Uh, Varys sort of just keeps talking about how fucked everything is. He talks about how the Kingsguard is bloody useless, uh, they're no longer the heroes and stalwart swordsmen that they once were. They are now mostly a bunch of fucking useless, useless lickspittles. Uh, Barris and Selmy is basically the only good man on the king's king's guard, and he's about to get sent off as well. Uh, so Varys basically lumps all the responsibility onto Ned's already overburdened shoulders and says, you're pretty much the only person who can help the king. It's pretty much up to you to save the day. Uh, and spoiler, he doesn't. Uh, and finally, finally, Ned asks, "All right, fucking Varys, you you who know so much, tell me then, who killed John Arryn?" Uh, and Varys says, "Well, I'll tell you how he died. Uh, Tears of Lys is the name of the poison." Uh, and Varys speculates, "Who might have poisoned John Arryn?" Well. Perhaps a certain boy called Sir Hugh, John Arryn's squire. Maybe Sir Hugh poisoned John Arryn under the directions of Cersei, and then Cersei told the mountain to kill Sir Hugh so that Sir Hugh wouldn't blab about it to anyone. And that's sort of how the chapter ends. They say, there's a hypothesis, and then Varys slips out. Though, of course, we know that hypothesis is false. It wasn't Cersei or Sir Hugh who poisoned... Uh, John Arryn, it was actually Lysa Arryn under the orders of Littlefinger. So why, then, was Sir Hugh killed? Uh, There are sort of three possibilities. One, Cersei had Sir Hugh killed by Gregor Clegane, uh, not because of anything to do with John Arryn, but actually because Cersei was concerned that as the squire of John Arryn, he might have known something about Cersei's incest. Uh, Cersei may have, but we don't re- well, we don't quite know the extent to which John Cersei knew that John Arryn knew about Cersei's incest. Uh, but it's not unreasonable to think that she suspected it. 
uh, and Cersei certainly knows that Ned is sniffing around, so maybe she killed. She got Gregor to kill Sir Hugh in order to prevent Ned finding out about the incest. Alternatively, Littlefinger got Sir Gregor to kill Sir Hugh uh, in order to further ferment Ned's paranoia about the Lannisters and get this whole Stark-Lannister war happening sooner. Or perhaps Littlefinger got Sir Hugh killed uh, because Sir Hugh might have actually genuinely known something about the poisoning of Jon Arryn by Littlefinger and Lysa Arryn, and so Littlefinger wanted to keep his schemes under wraps. The third possibility is that Sir Gregor was a fucking mad dog psycho murderer and he just wanted to kill a cunt. Never rule out the possibility that Gregor just wants to kill the cunt. I, I suspect that's just kind of his default mode. That's his default behavior. Un, uh, unless instructed otherwise, just run a cunt through with your lance. Some people are ridden that way, apparently, supposedly, at least within this book. So thank you for listening to this episode of Game of Thrones Abridged on Alt Swift X. I hope that you enjoyed. We will have a new episode for you out soon. Cheers. Cheers.